I have 12 noon on the East Coast. So good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance's new company compendium and updated primer on advanced nuclear technologies. My name is Ben Finzel. I'm president of Renew PR in Washington, DC, and I have the pleasure and privilege of working with NIA on communications. I will also be the moderator for today's conversation about these two new information resources. I'm going to introduce NIA Executive Director Judy Greenwald in a moment, but first a few notes about our agenda and our approach to today's conversation. After Judy provides an overview of the two new documents, NIA staffers Patrick White and Victor Ibarra Jr. are going to share highlights of what you'll find in the documents and updates on the information that they have included. We'll pause for a brief Q&A opportunity with these NIA staffers so that you can ask details related to the publication of these documents. From there, we're gonna have a response panel of two industry leaders who will share their thoughts on the industry and how they and their colleagues will use these materials with their audiences. That will be followed by an open Q&A before we wrap up by the top of the hour at 1 p.m. Eastern today. You're welcome to start asking questions now by typing them in the Q&A box along with your name and your affiliation. Once we begin the two Q&A sections, I'll do my best to answer the questions in the order we receive them. And we'll also open up the mics to allow you to ask questions during those Q&A sections as well. But now let's get started, let's get right to it. I'm happy to introduce NIA Executive Director, Judy Greenwald, to share a bit of background about these great new resources. Judy, over to you. Thanks so much, Ben. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that a yes? Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this briefing on the Nuclear Innovation Alliance's latest publication, Advanced Nuclear Reactor Technology, a company compendium, and a new update of our Advanced Nuclear Reactor Technology, a primer. NIA is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think and do tank working to create the conditions for success for advanced nuclear energy as a climate and energy solution. Through research, analysis, and education, we inform decarbonization and innovation policy, including advanced reactor licensing reform at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy's nuclear innovation efforts. We also collaborate with stakeholders to coordinate advanced reactor advocacy in the United States. The NIA team created this company compendium as an introduction to the advanced reactor business ecosystem for potential investors and other key stakeholders. The compendium includes brief descriptions of the companies and other entities associated with the planning, design, testing, construction, and operation of advanced nuclear energy projects. It also highlights leading advanced reactor developers and summarizes publicly available information on agreements between developers and other entities, including the private sector, government, universities, and other organizations. It's intended to serve as a complement to our primer. As this business ecosystem is expanding, even as we speak, we expect to continually update the compendium as an online living document. NIA originally released our primer in September 2021. The primer serves as a guide for media, congressional and administration staff, stakeholders, and anyone else who wants to understand the rapidly evolving advanced nuclear energy space. It's intended as a 101 document to demystify advanced nuclear reactors and to explain the characteristics of the most common types and leading designs. In the months since we released the primer, the advanced nuclear energy and technology community has gone through major updates in their technology timeline and siting. This is why we decided to release an updated version of the primer. With the exception of a handful of hardworking policy wonks in DC and a collection of engineers across the country, there are very few who can easily navigate the new advanced nuclear energy landscape. It's our hope that you'll consider NIA and this primer to be a resource, a place to start learning. And we hope you'll get in touch when you have questions or want to know more about this emerging technology and industry. Thanks again for joining us today. Back to you, Ben. Judy, thanks so much. Now I'm happy to introduce NIA Nuclear Innovation Analyst, Victor Ibarra Jr. and NIA Project Manager, Patrick White. Victor is gonna start us off with a user's guide to the two documents since he had a big role to play in developing both of them. And then Patrick is gonna highlight the specific licensing information updates that we included in the primer. So Victor, take it away. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. So at NIA, we see real value in making information about advanced reactors accessible, chiefly because it helps to straighten and contextualize everyone's understanding of the broader value proposition of advanced nuclear energy projects. NIA provides stakeholders with current technical information to enable more effective public and private discussions with companies, policymakers, investors, and other stakeholders. Nuclear energy can be intimidating and complex. The science, the technology, and the jargon can make the discussions about nuclear energy indecipherable to most people, which is why we created documents like the Primer and the Compendium to provide clear and concise descriptions on key advanced nuclear energy reactor technologies and topics to enable the readers to better understand and have technical discussions and claims about these advanced reactors. Nuclear energy is a rapidly evolving commercial field as Judy has already stated. Companies are looking to build their supply chains and start deployment of their technologies either now or soon into the future. And our new advanced nuclear energy company compendium and updated primer are latest examples of NIA resources that can help provide this kind of up-to-date information. Now I'm gonna spend a few minutes to share details from our new company compendium and highlight updates from our technology primer. The company compendium is part of NIA's work to educate more people and advance about advanced nuclear energy technologies, especially to business people, people and investors. The idea from the company compendium emerged from various discussions with stakeholders and investors who thought compiling information on the leading companies in the industry would be a useful tool. The company compendium looks at many of the leading advanced reactor companies here in the United States and Canada. It provides details that stakeholders and investors need to know, such as their headquarter locations, their project locations, their deployment timeline, and how far they are in the licensing process, both in the Canada and the United States. The compendium also addresses public agreements advanced reactor developers have made with other companies and organizations to support the design, testing, construction, and eventual operation of their reactors. It gives readers a sense of what kind of companies are working on advanced nuclear energy commercialization here in the US, Canada, and abroad. In contrast to the primer, which focuses on the advanced reactor themselves, the company compendium branches out to the whole supply chain needed to make those advanced reactors a reality. So if you ever need to know any information, like who's providing the helium blower for a high temperature gas reactor, you'll find that information in the company compendium. Now to touch a little bit on the primer. Like Judy said, the primer was first issued last September to provide a key educational resource on advanced nuclear energy technologies for the media, policymakers, stakeholder, and the interested public. Because it continues to be a go-to resource and because the advanced nuclear energy industry is evolving at such a rapid pace, it's important to really keep it up to date. In our updated primer that we are releasing today, we have included deployment timelines, the addition of another advanced reactor company, updates on agreements and awards and site locations that have been announced over the past year. Specific examples are new scale going public, Jihi Itachi announcing new projects in Canada and the United States, Terra Power announcing their site location for their Natrium project, which will be in Kemmerer, Wyoming, which is especially exciting because the Natrium project will be or provide a little bit of insight into how advanced nuclear energy projects can replace coal power plant infrastructure. Terra Power's partnership with Southern Company to demonstrate their molten chloride fast reactor technology at INL. Kairos Power and UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation announcing site selections for their fuel fabrication facilities in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, the addition of our clean energies into the, the uh, primer. Project Pele updates. So um, Project Pele decided to finally decide their final selection for their design and it will be moving forward with BWXT's design in the future and will be deployed at INL in 2024. And as you can clearly see by the summary of all these updates, it's a really exciting time to be involved in the advanced reactor innovation and com commercialization industry. So it's crucial that we continue this exciting momentum into the future. We hope these resources will be helpful to a broad group of stakeholders engaged in the advanced nuclear innovation, commercial commercialization and investments industry. Both of these resources, as Judy already stated, are intended to be living documents, meaning that we'll be updating them with new, infor new information as it comes along, and we'll be adding new companies and include new details. A good example of this is the fact that an advanced reactor company just signed a framework agreement to pursue opportunities to deploy their SMR technologies for industrial applications in Canada just this morning. So I'll be adding that very shortly after our call so we, everyone can have uh, the most up to uh, information available. 
The best way to keep track of these updates is just follow us regularly on Twitter at the NIA org and on LinkedIn at Nuclear Innovation Alliance. Next, my colleague Patrick White is going to talk about the licensing updates we included in this primer. Patrick, will you please take it over? Great, thanks so much, Victor, and great introduction on both the primer and the compendium. So one of the things that people are always interested about when we talk about the advanced nuclear energy space is when are these projects coming? And that can kind of consist of two separate things. What are the commercial deadlines? And then how does that relate to licensing and regulation? A lot of people are always asking, what about the regulation? What about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? And so having a firm idea of where these projects are in their timeline can have a really good insight on what types of commercial opportunities we might see in the future for advanced nuclear energy. So the first thing I wanna highlight is some of the updates that we have this year in thinking about the deployment of advanced reactors in the rest of this decade. Nuclear energy, and especially advanced nuclear energy, isn't something that's 20 years away. We're hoping to see deployment of a large number of advanced reactors this decade. And I wanted to highlight here some of the projects, uh, just a select number of the projects that are looking at to deploy this decade. One of the things that we're finding um, through a lot of our work and through a lot of our discussions with stakeholders is that private public partnerships are really accelerating the demonstration and deployment of these advanced reactors. And so here is a list of a few developers that have uh, different levels of federal partnerships with private companies and when they're looking at deploying in the United States. So one of the first examples that would, I would give is Oaklo. So Oaklo is a company looking at developing a micro reactor technology for deployment in a wide variety of situations. And they're looking at deploying as early as 2025 at the Idaho National Lab to try to demonstrate their commercial reactor technology. We then have in 2026, a couple of advanced reactor developers that are looking at either deploying uh, micro reactors in the case of Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation or a test reactor that really demonstrates the technology in the case of Kairos Power. Um, really kind of the big projects, big commercial projects that people are talking about are those that have been awarded under the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, or ARDP. And these are 50-50 uh, cost shares with the federal government to actually demonstrate full-scale commercial advanced reactor technology in the United States. Uh, Victor alluded to these projects a little bit earlier. We have the Natrium Project uh, with TerraPower and the XE100 from X Energy. Uh, both of these are really exciting projects. It's going to be novel advanced reactor technologies built here in the United States in the next five years. Um, as we look towards the back half of the decade, we start seeing commercial deployments of advanced light water technology, uh, specifically looking at G Hitachi's BWRX 300 and the new scale reactor technology. So we can see a lot of these reactors are coming. And then the next question is, where does licensing fit into this whole play? And where, how are they, these different organizations working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? If we can move to the next slide. Uh, recent, annou recent announcements by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission provided insights on what applicants are thinking about as they start looking towards uh, fiscal year 23 and how they plan on interacting with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on their different designs. So on this page, it gives a quick summary of different companies and different licensing tools that they're looking at using. So starting from left to right, on the far left-hand column, we see companies that have expressed an interest in actually having a specific site and deploying a reactor technology. So in this case, um, Oaklo Power or Oaklo has announced an interest in actually starting work and submitting a combined operating license for several of their reactor technologies. And then uh, the construction permit, kind of the traditional 10 CFR Part 50 approach for licensing reactors, um, X Energy, Terra Power, G Hitachi, and Kairos Power are all going to be in different stages of either submitting or having construction permit applications licensed by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So it's really exciting. These are all actual projects with specific sites. It's no longer a hypothetical reactor that might be built somewhere. These are firm projects. As we move to the center column, we start looking at companies that are really interested in saying, how can we have a standardized design that we're not just going to deploy one of, but we envision deploying large numbers of. And so they're using licensing tools called either standard design approvals or standard design certifications as a way to try to get regulatory approval for their design as they kind of move towards deployment. So in this case, we see NuScale looking at trying to get uh, standard design approval for an, up power, an upgraded version of its NuScale power module, its NPM20. And then Terrestrial Energy is looking at seeking standard design approval for its integral molten salt reactor, its IMSR. Uh, Westinghouse has also started uh, discussions on getting design certification for its Avinci reactor. So these are really exciting technologies where, again, companies are saying, how can we deploy a standardized reactor technology and turn nuclear energy from something where it's a major project to a product that you can actually deploy for utilities and other energy users. And then on the right, we have what's called pre-application interaction. 
So these are companies that don't have a firm plan, at least with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to submit a formal license document in FY23, but are going to be starting extended discussions with the regulator to try to set the stage for subsequent licensing action. And so here you see a large number of other companies, including NuScale, Poltec, General Atomics, BWXT, Flive, and uh, Advanced Reactor Concepts, or ARC Clean Energy, are all going to be engaging in pre-application interactions in FY23. So what we see here is just a lot of excitement. A lot of companies are taking the next step of moving forward with the regulator. And that's really gonna be where we're moving when we start saying about advanced reactor deployments in this, in this decade. And so with that kind of quick summary on licensing, I'll turn it back over to Ben. Patrick, Victor, thank you both very much. I think the takeaway there is there's a lot going on and a lot more being added every day to Victor's point before about updating uh, the materials already. Uh, we now have time for a couple questions about these documents, about why NIA published them, what NIA hopes to accomplish with sharing them, et cetera. Um, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box. I see we have a couple already in the chat, so I'm going to start with those, but we do have time for a couple more. So by all means, please uh, either raise your hand um, or put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them. The first one is from Oladakan Ojewole, um, and Oladakan asks, are these technologies and their deployment only operable in the US only? Great question. So right now I wouldn't say that they're only operable in the US. Um, for the sake of this primer, we focus mostly on kind of deployment in the US and Canada. Um, and a lot of the conversations that we've been having with different stakeholders, that seems to be the first market for a lot of these designs. That being said, if we're talking about clean energy and specifically as advanced nuclear energy as something that's going to help us reach our deep decarbonization goals and enable energy access around the world, we're going to want to make these technologies available everywhere. And so I think what we're going to see, especially in the next few years, is a discussion on how we can try to export a lot of these advanced reactor technologies and make them available around the world. That being said, there are going to be other challenges we're going to work through, how to think about export laws, how to think about uh, supporting deployment of these technologies abroad, and how to think about regulation in other countries. And so I think these are gonna be part of ongoing discussions, but I think this is something where we're seeing the first few reactors of hopefully what's gonna be a huge global industry. Thank you. Um, next question is from Robert Fortner and Robert asks if slides will be made available. Yes, they will. So um, if you're a participant in this event, um, we should have your contact info and we'll send those out. Uh, the next one is in the Q and A box. So thank you for following directions there. Uh, Nafis Fuad asks, how much will one kilowatt hour of electricity cost from these advanced reactors? Well, that's a simple question with a long answer. <laughs> oh, it definitely is. Uh, the one thing I would say is that at NIA, we're not going to go ahead and start making claims of what energy is going to cost. Um, this is something where I think a lot of the developers are looking through their supply chains, looking through their construction and business models, and are trying to work out what are the business cases for these different technologies in different markets. Um, one thing I'll just kind of quickly add, and I hate to say it's sidestepping the question a little bit, is that I think as we start looking towards kind of the deployment of clean energy in really large numbers and hitting kind of really, really deep decarbonizations, the standard metric of just what is one single kilowatt hour of power costs might not necessarily be the right way to kind of think about future clean energy systems. What we're going to have to do is really kind of consider how the all of above strategy leads to the total cost of energy. It's not just maybe what one hour, one kilowatt hour of electricity from solar panel costs or an advanced nuclear reactor costs, but how we can think about what it takes to have a kind of sustainable and reliable electricity system. What's the combination of solar, wind, hydro, um, advanced nuclear and other kind of clean energy sources, and then how we supplement that with storage and other methods. So I think one of the conversations we're going to have to have is what does it take to have a sustainable and affordable kind of all of the above clean energy strategy. Thank you. Um, Victor, Judy, you want to add anything before I move on? I think Patrick covers the topic pretty well. So thank you. Good. Next question um, in the chat box and the Q&A box. So thanks for being so complete. Is from Lyman Jordan. How are these technologies planning for spent slash used fuel disposal? Again, great question. This is something I think as people are looking out towards thinking about advanced nuclear technology, thinking about deployment, it always comes back to what do we do with the waste? And I think this is something that with a lot of the advanced reactor developers today, we're seeing kind of a two-pronged answer. The first part is thinking proactively about what waste forms advanced nuclear reactors are going to make and then how to effectively store those. How do you make sure they're being stored in kind of a safe, responsible way so you can helpfully kind of manage the full life cycle of an advanced nuclear facility? In parallel, there's a much larger discussion that I think we're having in the, in the United States and really it's been happening all over the world 
about what is kind of a sustainable long-term strategy for advanced nuclear fuels and kind of the back end of the fuel cycle, as they like to call it in the industry. And this is something where it's going to take a combination of kind of federal policy and engagement with stakeholders across the spectrum to say what is a good way to try to solve this problem. Um, historically in the United States, we didn't necessarily think about community engagement and really kind of seeking consent of communities when we talked about building these kind of long-term spent, uh, spent fuel or used fuel solutions. But moving to the idea of kind of consent-based storage, whether it's interim storage, uh, long-term geologic disposal, or maybe thinking about uh, advanced reactor fuel recycling are all potential options moving forward. So I think this is something that you can have in kind of conversations with different advanced reactor developers and then really at a higher policy level to say what we're going to be doing with the spent fuel and used fuel. But I can definitely tell you in the conversations that we have with different organizations, this is something they're taking very seriously and a lot of groups are trying to think about with a new lens. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Judy, Victor, do you want to add anything before I move on? Nope, Patrick Good. is great at what he does. <laughs> oh, thank you, Victor. Yeah, sorry, I'm hogging the airtime on these. These are great questions coming in. We love to see the engagement from everyone that's here. Um, we're really excited about these documents and are really excited to see people using them. I have one more before we move on, and this is for any of you. What are the biggest takeaways in the advanced nuclear energy space from the updates in the last year? Victor highlighted a couple of them, but what are the things that people should be looking for in the next year? Any one of you? So we don't know. Um, I do think that it's just a rapidly emerging and exciting space. So it, it's it's really hard to know um, what's going to happen next. As Victor said just this morning, there were additional announcements. I think it's important to pay attention as these um, developers advance their technology and their businesses. And so it's a very exciting um, arena commercially as well as from a technology innovation perspective. And also there's a lot happening on the regulatory front. So there's just a lot of activity, multiple fronts, and we'll try to keep up as best as we can to help you all keep up. Um, but I, I guess I, all I would say is just continue to watch this space. We have one more question, which I'm gonna to defer to the next Q and A. It's from Dan Yerman from Neutron Bytes. It's about HALU. Um, so we will answer that great question. I just wanna make sure that we um, give everyone a chance to speak and we can open this up to a broader conversation. So we're gonna move on from our Q and A to our response panel. Um, we're very excited to have two special guests for this response panel today. Uh, Art Hyde and James Wolf are industry leaders with two different perspectives on advanced nuclear. Art Hyde is a member of NIA's advisory committee and James Wolf's firm, Arc Clean Energy, which Victor mentioned before, is a member of NIA's industry, industry Innovation Leadership Council. I'm gonna introduce each one of them both right now in the order in which they will speak, and then we can hear from both of them um, next sort of one after the other without having to hear from me again. So first, Art Hyde is partner and portfolio manager at Segra Capital Management. And there, um, Hyde has been instrumental in all of the firm's thematic investments, including developing and co-managing Segra Resource Partners, the firm's nuclear and fuel cycle focused hedge fund. Um, he is a contributing member of the World Nuclear Association and is on several drafting subcommittees of the World Nuclear Fuel Report. It's my interest in putting the HALU question off for just a little bit. Um, he's a member of the American Nuclear Society and the advisory committee uh, of the NIA, as I mentioned. Um, he previously worked at J.P. Morgan Chase, and he has a bachelor's in law, jurisprudence, and social thought from Amherst College. Very cool. Welcome, Art. Um, and after Art speaks, James is going to speak. James is Vice President Finance at Arc Clean Energy, where he leads fundraising and investor relations. James has over 15 years experience in cross-border finance and private equity investments. He previously held positions at Deutsche Bank, Cerberus Capital Management, and the venture capital fund NKW Capital. He graduated from Stanford University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in International Relations and Japanese, which is so cool, um, <laughs> as his minor. Um, Art, over to you. Thanks, Ben. And uh, thank you to the whole team at NIA for having me. Uh, Judy and the team do a great job. And I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so I thought I'd just give a few data points on kind of why we're focused on nuclear, why we think it's interesting and how we got here. Um, so we started looking at nuclear power back in 2016. And at the time, if I'm, if I'm being honest, it was quite contrarian. Um, the sector was underfollowed. I think there was a, an assumption, especially among kind of Western investors, investors in the US and Europe, 
but New Career was a bit of a melting ice cube, you know, that it hadn't seen a lot of growth and innovation in the last 10 or 15 years. And so there was really a misunderstanding about the potential of nuclear energy to the broader energy transition. Um, but I think from our perspective, we've always been big believers in the fact that investing is actually a rate of change business. And so sometimes the most interesting opportunities and the most money can be made in places where something goes from deeply out of favor to somewhat in a fair way for, for most of the investing landscape. And so kind of in 2016, 2017, we started to buckle down, um, kind of integrate into the industry and, and learn about um, why it might be misunderstood. Um, and I think just looking back historically at different energy transitions that have been successful, we saw a lot of really phenomenal examples, um, whether it's Sweden or France, I think we saw that even traditional nuclear had a phenomenal ability once it was committed to, to actually scale and decarbonize an economy in an extremely brief time frame. Um, so when we looked out at the future of the global energy transition, um, we just saw this massive disconnect between what your average investor thought about nuclear technology and what we thought was needed in order to meet our carbon targets. Um, so in 2018, we launched Segra Resource Partners to focus exclusively on the industry. Um, and since then, there's been a real sea change in focus towards decarbonization. We're talking about, uh, I think, a shift from thinking that clean energy was broadly good to now true commitments, in many cases, legally binding government or corporate commitments to a zero carbon uh, world. And I think if you, if you understand and, and look at nuclear um, under that landscape, it provides something that other technologies simply don't. And that's especially true for advanced nuclear. So um, we're big believers in the future of the technology and innovation here. Um, we think that if capitalized appropriately and given the right mandates and support from governments, advanced nuclear can be built cheaper, quicker, uh, safer, although we think the, the history of the industry has a phenomenal safety track record. Um, and it also just gives you a different solution set for deep decarbonization, um, whether it's green hydrogen or ammonia, desalination, industrial heat, load following for, for wind and solar. Um, we think that nuclear brings a different set of tools to policymakers and to corporates uh, than the rest of the landscape. Um, so then why are we here today? Why do we participate in NIA? Um, if we're being honest, nuclear power has not been financed by private capital for at least the last 30 years in a real way, maybe ever. I mean, if you look at the origins of nuclear power, it was always supported by governments and large industrial players. The Silicon Valley startup approach to nuclear and, and truly innovative designs is somewhat new. And that new type of funding really needs investor education to get generalist capital up the curve. We're not talking about startup capital, we're talking about commercialization scaling capital. Um, and a, a result of the industry being, um, I, I would say, out of the limelight for, for private capital um, for, for most of our lives is that there's a lack of nuclear expertise within the in institutional investor landscape. Um, it's a tough industry to learn. Like people joke about finance being a high barrier to entry. Um, if you like acronyms, you'll love nuclear. Um, whoever came up with high assay, low enriched uranium as an approachable topic for new fuels clearly was not thinking about uh, opening up to, to generalist capital. And I, I say that a bit joking, but um, I do think that industry education, talking to investors about what the opportunities look like and having a centralized uh, repository of information like the one NIA is putting out today is incredibly impactful because James, who's going to speak next, doesn't want to spend the first 45 minutes of every pitch explaining nuclear 101. Um, so I, I think what we're doing here today is important. And I'll just leave you with, you know, I think what we see is the opportunity set for the industry, which is uh, maybe best outlined by um, Jigger Shaw at the Loan Programs Office. He, he was at an event hosted by Guggenheim and NIA about a couple months ago. And he thinks that, I believe it was $100 billion in private capital are needed to support advanced nuclear by 2030. Uh, I think he said a trillion dollars by 2050. Um, that's a phenomenal opportunity for investors um, and for the companies uh, that, that NIA represents. Um, and at least from my seat, having raised a fund dedicated to the industry in 2018 and actually being in the market raising a venture capital fund focused on the industry today, 
I can say that in those brief four years, the conversation has really shifted. When I was out in the market looking at talking to allocators about why nuclear was worth their time four years ago, we spent 80% of every discussion talking about why nuclear had a future. In today's road shows, it's the first 10 minutes. They understand nuclear has a role. They understand it's important. What they're focused on is understanding how it's investable, what the timelines and scaling supply chains look like, um, and really how to pick winners. And so uh, I think that's a phenomenal step in the right direction, and we're, we're really proud to be part of it. Great, thanks, Art. And thank you to Judy, the NIA team, and Ben uh, for hosting this event. So I'm gonna briefly introduce ARC and then share some thoughts on uh, the financing of SMRs and how NIA is helping. Uh, so first, so at ARC, we are developing small modular reactors to replace fossil power on the grid and enable low carbon industrial projects. We are deploying our first units with our launch utility customer who runs with power in Atlantic Canada to replace coal generation. We are also participating in the US Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program with almost 30 million in funding awarded so far to support our future US deployment. Our product is a 100 megawatt sodium cooled fast reactor, uh, leveraging proven technology with a prototype that ran successfully for 30 years in Idaho through the US National Labs. We're in advanced generation four SMR that addresses the key issues of existing nuclear, with walkaway safety, the ability to deal with waste, and attractive economics from a simple modular factory built design. So my role is focused on financing, and I'm very grateful for NIA's support to encourage more capital to the industry and help bring new SMRs to market. With recent global events and increasing concern around climate and energy security, we've seen a growing interest from investors in SMRs. However, most of them are new to the nuclear industry. We're often asked by investors, how does ARC fit into the overall SMR landscape? And NIA's primer and compendium do a great job of comparing the different SMR companies and where they're coming to market. People often think that one SMR technology will dominate. We see large opportunities for a range of SMR offerings from new light water reactors for large grids to micro units in remote areas and generation four advanced SMRs like ours, which create higher heat, well-suited for industrial uses. NIA's materials also help to clearly differentiate SMRs from traditional nuclear in terms of their size, cost, waste, and flexibility. And all this is presented in easy to understand language which you don't need a PhD to understand. And this point is critical to lower the barriers to entry for non-technical people to enter the industry. Um, and the last point I wanna make is NIA's work is helpful to encourage broader research coverage of the space from investment banks and others, a key component to expand investor support of SMRs. So thank you so much, everyone, and look forward to uh, further discussion on the panel. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. That was really helpful context. Nothing like hearing from two industry leaders to really understand what all this means and, and how it relates. And um, I, boy, I, I feel like Art, um, if you like acronyms, you'll, lo you'll love advanced nuclear. Kind of sounds like my career. Um, I'm, I'm in Washington, DC, the land of acronyms. So um, I, I love that line. And the $100 billion and the $1 trillion certainly uh, lays out some table stakes for us there. Um, so I see all of our NIA participants have turned their mics back on and their cameras back on. That's great. We are ready for questions. We do have one uh, and a half um, in the, uh, the Q&A box. So I'm going to start there. We're going to go to Dan Yerman's question about HALU first. Um, a number of reactors will require HALU fuel, e.g. with U-235 at between 5% and 19% enrichment. Current assessments from NEI and others have raised questions of whether this fuel will be available in time for the deployment of these reactors. HALU, which was coming from Russia, is no longer available. What is your assessment of this issue? Great question. Who wants to start? So I'm happy to take this one on. Um, really great question, Dan. Uh, this is something that I think over the last couple of years, people have started to kind of recognize the importance of thinking about both the front end of the fuel cycle and then also kind of the back end of the fuel cycle. And so when we talk about HALU availability, it's really trying to think about how we're going to have that next generation of fuel available for advanced reactors. Um, NIA has been doing a lot of work in this space. Um, if you're interested in getting to the full details on thinking about high assay, low enriched uranium, what's the history, what's the challenges, um, I'd actually first refer you to the uh, Nuclear Innovation website. 
uh, Nuclear Innovation Alliance actually released a white paper this past April that kind of discusses in in very long detail um, all the challenges of producing HALU and what potential options are. To answer your specific question, though, thinking about where we're talking of getting HALU for kind of these first advanced reactors, when we talk about the challenges of high assay, low enriched uranium, we kind of viewed in three different time frames. What's the near term time frame? How are we going to essentially help provide fuel for the first set of advanced reactors that we're building that are going to need this fuel? The midterm, how do we meet the need kind of in the late 2020s, early 2030s? And then kind of moving forward into the long term, how do we think about HALU, HALU fuel availability? Um, in NIA's perspective and what we kind of outline in our white paper is that in the midterm, we think there's an opportunity for the federal government to help support the development and deployment of new infrastructure in the United States. Um, when it comes to HALU, we talk about a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem. Developers who can produce the material are a little hesitant to put significant capital investments into this new fuel infrastructure until they have a demonstrated market for the fuel. Simultaneously, advanced reactor developers and people who are interested in investing in the technology might be a little hesitant to buy advanced reactors if they don't know the fuel is going to be available. And so we think there's a really good opportunity for the federal government to come in and help kind of provide that financial assurance with the idea that any kind of capacity that's ultimately built, if the private markets have um, alternative options, the federal government would actually be able to use that HALU for different government programs, such as fueling advanced reactors or for the production and support of certain programs like uh, NASA's program, where they're looking at using high assay, low enriched uranium. And so we think there are kind of opportunities to solve that in the midterm. In the near term, and I think specifically this is what Dan's question is getting at, how do we have the fuel available for these first reactors um, if the Russian supply is no longer available? Um, a couple of options come to play. Um, one is actually uh, the Department of Energy is currently looking at recovering HALU from material that it already has available kind of within the Department of Energy's complex. So this is fuels that were previously used in other testing programs or material that has been used for kind of other DOE activities. The second option would be looking at trying to use a process called downblending, where we take highly enriched uranium that was previously used for kind of Department of Defense and Department of Energy weapons programs, and then essentially take it from a very, very high level of uranium 235 enrichment and then bring it down to the 20% that we need for HALU. And so this is a capability that's well understood, but it comes down to a question of how can we have the, essentially the facilities and the material available to do this. And so this is actually an ongoing conversation right now at the US Department of Energy, as they try to figure out what's gonna be the best pathway forward to make HALU available for these advanced reactors. So we think it is possible, but we also think it really needs to be a priority. Uh, this is something where the Department of Energy and Congress are gonna to have to put a lot of focus in this, to make sure that we have the right resources available at the right time with the right people to make sure we have the fuel for advanced reactors. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Very complex answer there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have to say it's one challenge. Everything in nuclear energy ends up being a little bit of a complex answer. Yeah, and maybe I just tack on just one comment. Um, for generalists out there, folks that are looking at nuclear for the first time, I think what's important to emphasize is that this is not a scientific issue. It's not as if we can't make the fuel it's not as if Russia has a capability that the U.S. or Western governments cannot replicate. This is a question of price, capital, and really commercial considerations around the customer base for this new fuel. So the good news is those are all things that can be solved. They can be solved with government support, which Patrick outlined very well. Um, and I think in the long run, if this industry is going to grow and be as impactful as we think it can be, having a secure, well-funded, stable supply chain, whether it's uranium or enrichment or fabrication and, and things like uh, uh, transport in, in the US are incredibly important. So um, I think the good news is it's very solvable, but is it a national security issue? Is it every bit as important as anything else that Congress is looking at right now? I think it is. Um, so you know, again, props to NIA for, for being a voice there. Thanks, anyone else before we move on? I just want to flag um, that the statistics that Art mentioned, um, the, the 100 billion and the 1 trillion, um, are actually from um, a breakthrough study, which Adam Stein from Breakthrough put in the chat. Um, and uh, you can see the link there um, to the breakthrough.org articles advancing nuclear energy report to learn more about that. Adam, thanks for flagging that. And Lyman Jordan had a follow-up question in our Q&A box, which Patrick has answered. Lyman, I see your hand is still up. Um, would you like to follow up on that or did you just not take your hand down? We can turn your mic on if you wanna ask or we can move on. Oh, you took your hand off. Okay, so I think we've answered your question. Um, and for folks who wanna know, the question was sort of following up on spent fuel and Patrick um, 
gave a very complete answer in the, in the um, Q&A box. So Patrick, thanks for doing that. Um, there's another question from Aladakun Odewole. How did the commercial nuclear power plant become acceptable? I feel we can weigh out its greater opportunities and why it can compete with the commercial nuclear plants. No one wants to invest in a new technology coming out and making their lands a dumping ground. How can countries who can't afford the commercial scale benefit from the new technology? Well, that's a big question. So I'm, I'm gonna, it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated question. So make sure, I hope I'm answering the correct question. So I think that nuclear power has a lot of benefits. Um, it also has a lot of challenges, and this is true of pretty much any technology. And I think we're getting renewed attention on nuclear power for two reasons. One is because we need climate solutions. And while there are lots of climate solutions, the nuclear power climate solution has a lot of benefits that other climate solutions can offer. And in particular, it can provide firm zero carbon electricity, that not every um, option that we have can do that. So we need an electric power system that has a multiple uh, diversity of resources. And one of those resources has to be firm electricity that you can count on. And it's gotta be zero carbon to solve the climate problem. So people are sort of looking at um, nuclear power once again, with this new lens of being concerned about climate and looking for this climate solution. The other exciting thing that's happening is that in parallel, a number of companies, and, and Patrick walked us through this, and you can see more detail on that in both the primer and the compendium, are innovating and finding new ways to do um, nuclear power in a way that's going to be better going forward and address some of the challenges of the past. And in particular, these new technologies, they come in smaller sizes, which can help on a lot of the financing issues that have occurred in the past and the project management issues. And they also are more um, adaptable and more flexible so they can fit better into our emerging energy system. So there's a lot of excitement around these new technologies because we need them. And there's a lot of excitement around these technologies because there's a bunch of really innovative companies who are coming up with really exciting solutions to help us solve our problems. Thank you, Judy. Anyone else want to add on before we move on? No, okay. At the risk of, oh, I promise I won't do this every time. The only other thing I'd say is that I don't think it has to be either or. You know, people ask us all the time, are you for large scale nuclear or are you for small nuclear? Are you for gen four or gen three? And the answer is yes. Like we. We think nuclear writ large is really important. And I think that, that um, when we compare traditional large light water reactors to the reactors that we're discussing today, it's, it's again, it's a different deployment opportunity. Um, the high heat nature of some of these advanced reactors solve a fundamentally different problem than large light water reactors did when they were invented in the 50s and 60s. And we're also trying to tackle a different problem than we were back then. You know, we didn't create nuclear power plants because we were targeting deep decarbonization. We created them because they're really phenomenal ways to get electricity generation on grid using energy, energy density. I think today, if we really want to decarbonize things like maritime transport and really get to the point where we're at net zero, not just for the electricity grid, but for every other sector of the economy, you actually need these technologies to work because there's not that many alternatives being invested in today. Excellent point, thank you. Um, so Lyman Jordan followed up. Um, thanks for the good answer, Patrick. Natural Resources Defense Council states that its only remaining objection to nuclear power generation is our failure to deal with the existing spent fuel. This waste is considered by them both an environmental and a defense security risk. So Patrick and anyone else wanna respond to Lyman and then we'll go to more questions. Well, I would just say that, that the existing spent fuel is a, is a great asset that eventually, once the relations are there, can be used by advanced reactors to fuel them. So, that, I mean, there, there is a solution there, but it, it's going to take some time. And technically, it's been proven already. Patrick, you want to add anything else? Yeah, I think I'd just emphasize, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, kind of changing the political conversation, changing the social conversation around this. And it's something that's critical. 
um, as we kind of see the idea of building social license for advanced nuclear technology. It's recognizing the benefits and then it's saying, okay, are the companies and a society, are we responsibly dealing with the challenges? And I think we've been able to demonstrate the, dealing with a lot of the challenges historically. And this is something that we're gonna to continue to work on. Um, but I think I like it, like I said in the, in the first response, um, this is something where we need to be moving kind of in tandem. Uh, climate change and trying to think about the clean energy transition is something that's way too important to kind of wait on. So let's try to make progress on one uh, while we're solving the other and just recognize that, hey, if we're kind of all approaching this in good faith and we all kind of have the same objectives, um, I think it's something that we can definitely solve. Thank you, Patrick. Anyone else? I, I guess I'll just mention that any way that we make energy produces some type of waste. And in fact, the, our ability to handle uh, nuclear waste or spent fuel, you know, whichever term you prefer, is actually quite excellent. Uh, we are managing it very well. Uh, we do need an, an ultimate permanent solution for it, which um, people are working on, and that's going to involve, in our view, a consent-based process. We have to make sure that we put waste in places that people uh, don't object to it. It's very important that this is a fair and uh, process that society takes really seriously. And we also note that technically we're doing a very good job of managing this waste. It's, it actually is very small quantities compared to the waste streams from other types of energy sources. And it's really important that we do a good job on this. It's very important that we uh, make progress on it. And there's also these opportunities that James mentioned where we're able, we'll be able to reuse spent fuel in many of these new technologies. Thank you, Judy. Um, we do have uh, time for more questions and I see we have a couple coming into the Q&A box. Um, I, I will go to one of those and then we'll go to some of the other ones I have. Uh, this is from Paul Bauman. It's clear we have both increasing demand and supply of different types of advanced reactors. So what is the primary barrier to rapid deployment? Good question. I, I guess I could start. I mean, just from the investor side, we reference one chicken and the egg problem, but I think that the nuclear industry is rife with chicken and the egg problems, um, <laughs> if we're being honest. I think there's a perception that nuclear is expensive because financing is costly. But by the way, financing the first of a kind for anything is costly. When you're developing a new technology, whether it's a new iPhone or a new automobile or a new type of battery, the first of a kind is expensive. And it's proving that the first of a kind can be built safely, effectively on time and on budget that allows you to benefit from a positive learning curve. There's no other in industry that has that issue where it, it doesn't benefit from repetition and scaling. And there's no reason to think that nuclear can't. So I think we're at a really unique time right now for the industry where you have these phenomenal technologies. I think one of the, one of the most promising parts of investing in advanced nuclear is that they're not science projects. These are not paper reactors. In many cases, examples of these reactors have been working at the smaller scale in our national labs programs for decades. You know, we have a working knowledge of the technologies. So they are much more proven than other, you know, I would say high risk venture states. Um, in terms of scaling them, it's moving, you know, in a timeline that, that Patrick so outlined so clearly from concept to test deployment to customer order books. And I think what's so exciting from an investor is that we're finally in that seat. Over the next 10 years, not 15, not 20, we are going to have a number of advanced reactors deployed on grid in the US, Canada, and likely in Europe. So customers are, able, are going to be able to see a physical example of what they can buy. They're going to understand the balance of plant. They're going to understand the economics. Th that's the moment you want to be focused on. Um, by the time the order books are built and there's cranes everywhere, you know, everything will have re-rated from an investment perspective. So anyway, not to, not to give an overly bright outlook, but I mean, I think that solving those scaling issues, the supply chain issues um, is, is really where the finance community comes in and needs to be a part of the conversation. Okay. Yeah, th thanks so much, Art. I would also note, and maybe Ben could put this in the chat. We have a report uh, by NIA, NIA from a couple months ago called Fish and Vision, in which we lay out you know, the key challenges to the industry as well as the key solutions. 
And we really think that there we need a whole of society effort on this. We need the private investment community. We need government investment. We need public policy. We need um, licensing reform at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We need a lot of things to happen at once. And a lot is happening and a lot could happen. And it's really up to us as collectively to make this work. And I think in some ways um, we're at a similar space to a similar position to where we have been with some other zero carbon technologies um, in the last decade or two. And they had early days of struggles and um, innovation. And in the beginning, you just get a few, and then suddenly it accelerates. And once you get past those past few and you demonstrate that you can really do this and you learn by doing, we are very, we really think we're poised for a very exciting future for advanced nuclear energy. I'll just add on one thing to what Art said about this as well. Um, when you talk with folks that work in the utility space that are thinking about deployment of new generation, they might be a little hesitant to build the first of a kind reactor just due to the commercial risks, but they say they'll line up for the second, third, and fourth. Um, once you can actually demonstrate that technology and say, yeah, th with the changes we've made, with the design, with the way we think about construction, with the way we think about management, this becomes a realistic technology that you can deploy that's when I think you're really going to start to see a lot of the flood, the, I hate to say the floodgates open up, but kind of a lot of commercial interest in how to deploy these very broadly. Thank you for that. We have um, two more questions I'm going to combine. Lyman Jordan following up to ask about the security risk of all the above ground storage and Nafis Fuad following up to say, can we solve the waste problem by sending the waste back to the company that builds the reactor? My country, Bangladesh, plans to send waste back to Russia. That's why I'm asking whether it's possible to do the same for these new SMRs. So in short, yes, you can have uh, take back agreements and, and that is something that uh, we could do uh, just as Russia could do it. It's a little challenging um, for the United States because we compete against state-owned enterprises in Russia and China. So we have to have a bit of a different model, which would be some kind of public-private partnership where we could work with, with countries and we need to do that. So we, we need to um, take advantage of the strengths of the US system in order to be able to compete effectively with state-owned enterprises. So the model, the business model, the agreements are gonna look a little different, but we also can compete in this arena and make this easier for countries who may not have the infrastructure that we do to deal with the whole fuel cycle. Can I just maybe tag on because sure. I talk a lot. Um, so, so that's also where innovation and design come in. Um, if you're talking about these advanced projects and James could probably speak to art specifically, but a lot of the time you're talking about a much longer refueling. You know, if it's 10 or 20 years dealing with that spent fuel, transporting new fuel to a reactor and dealing with that is a much different consideration than refueling a reactor every 18 months. So I actually think there's a lot of advantages to advanced reactors when it comes to exporting into emerging market countries. And the fuel cycle, while still complex, can be far simpler than a traditional large light water reactor. So, so that's one, one point. The other thing I'd say, just because um, um, Lyman seems very focused on spent nuclear fuel, and I understand the, the um, focus on it, Let's be totally clear. Um, it's harder for NIA folks to say this, but, but I can be pretty direct. Uh, more people have been killed falling off their roofs and installing solar panels than American citizens from spent fuel, right? Just by definition, that's a true fact. So it's not that it's not an issue. It is an issue. It will always be an issue for the industry and it's one that they're hyper-focused on. But let's also contextualize it versus other technologies. Um, when we think about it from an investor seat, I think that the same issues that kind of plague heritage nuclear become opportunities for us. As nuclear grows, as nuclear sees more capital and more innovation, that's not just going to be constrained to the innovation uh, to, to the generation side. I actually think it's a real opportunity for investors like me to look for disposal te techniques, uh, reprocessing, and some advanced reactors that again use that spent nuclear fuel as a fuel um, to solve and close the close the cycle. So again, not looking for only positives here, but I think looking at one um, perceived issue and kind of pushing the technology off to the side is just the wrong approach. Nuclear provides too many solutions to end the debate there. 
if we can you know, move forward and try to invest in solutions as a society, I think we'll go a lot farther. And also, I would say the, the, the advanced reactors with a longer refueling cycle, it flows into the energy security concerns. So for example, ours, we have a 20 year refueling cycle. So you're not, you're a developing country. You're not concerned about every year getting fuel supply from perhaps a hostile country. So I think that's really important. And then also, like Art said, the advanced reactors you know, burn fuel a lot more efficiently and they're able to recycle the fuel. So you know, the waste issue is, is, is really not nearly as much of a concern. And just one last point I want to give, just to answer uh, the question directly. Um, some people are often concerned about kind of storage of spent nuclear fuel and the physical security, physical safety. Um, at least growing up, I was I was raised on the TV show The Simpsons. When I think of nuclear fuel and nuclear waste and that, I think of giant drums full of gro glowing green goo. And if you think about that, you think, oh, well, that might be hard to deal with. But when you actually take a look at what spent nuclear fuel is like in the United States, it's much different. It's long pieces of metallic fuel assemblies that are then carefully stored in metal containers that are then put in concrete, that are put in metal, that are put in concrete. And those are actually stored above ground or in different configurations for kind of this long-term storage on site um, while we work on kind of what the, the ultimate solution is for spent nuclear fuel. And so these facilities are designed incredibly robustly. They're regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for all types of um, natural events, for any types of accidents, for any types of kind of attacks. And I can tell you there are amazing videos you can find online if you're ever curious. Um, Sandia National Labs, uh, one of the Department of Energy research labs, actually did experiments in the 1970s and 80s where they tested a lot of these casks and a lot of these spent storage uh, designs, including uh, having a train locomotive powered by a rocket engine to collide into these things to demonstrate that they could survive just an incredible amount of uh, potential damage without releasing any type of material. And so I think when we talk about this, it's something that we need to think about, we need to move forward on, um, but it's also something where the existing solutions that we have are really, really robustly designed. And it's something where we have a lot of assurances that these can kind of safely maintain the material where we, while we think about kind of that long-term solution. Thank you, Patrick. And we have a lot more questions. We won't get to all of them. I think we have time for one more from Robert Fortner. Any sense for how much government funding will be needed to provide for industry's need for HALU? Good question. A lot. I will say it's it's it can be a lot, but I think it's kind of thinking big picture of how the government is trying to support a program. Um, so again, if this is something you're interested, I really encourage you, you to go to the Nuclear Innovation website. And maybe someone can drop the link to the, the HALU white paper in the chat while I'm talking about this. Um, but there are a lot of different options for how to support kind of an emerging market. Um, at NIA, we don't necessarily think that the government should have kind of a long-term involvement in thinking about a HALU market or advanced nuclear fuels. But it's really how can it step in, help catalyze market development, and then back out and say, okay, this is a mature commercial operation. The private, the private sector is really best equipped to kind of manage this moving forward. So one of the models that NIA thinks could be really successful thinking about kind of development of HALU is serving as kind of the first buyer. So the government would come in and then negotiate with different companies that are willing to produce this HALU fuel and say, hey, we know you're setting up kind of a commercial uh, risk by putting a lot of money into new infrastructure. So the federal government will guarantee that we'll buy the first certain amount for a certain number of years at a certain price from your facility to help make sure it's a good investment for you and that you're comfortable kind of setting up this new infrastructure. So then the US government would need funding to be able to kind of pur uh, purchase that initial load of material. But that material has a lot of value. And so the government could then say, okay, how can we sell this back to developers or sell it out on the open market to make sure that it's a product and essentially provide a guarantee to developers and different companies that this material is going to be available to them. And so in that way, it might be kind of a large numeric appropriation, uh, kind of on the orders of billions of dollars. But ultimately, if you're able to recover costs from the sale of that material downstream, it ends up having a fairly low kind of net impact on the taxpayer. And so that's one way that we think about it. It's essentially the federal government helping the process along and not necessarily kind of a long-term subsidy or just a long-term payment out to these developers. And so it gets a little bit into the complex mass of how you think about federal support programs, um, but we do think there are opportunities there to do it in a fiscally responsible way. Thank you. Anyone want to add in before we wrap up? Maybe just a clarifying point, because when you throw out billions of dollars, it could be misinterpreted. I think you clarified it, but just so the actual CapEx upfront required to build Halo enrichment facilities in the US is not billions of dollars. 
it's um, a few hundred million dollars likely. There's two play, there's two or three players. Without getting into too much of the weeds, there'll be an RFP that'll go out. It'll be competitive. The U.S. government's considering a few options. And when when Patrick references billions of dollars, that's talking about long term contract commitments for for the actual end production, which again will be sold back to the market. So it's not a multi billion dollar subsidy in this industry at all. Um, it's it's you know in terms of value creation, it's it's a much smaller required um, support structure, I guess. Great, thank you so much, Art. You can tell what happens when you have an engineer try to talk about no, business. No, no, no. I maybe miss a nuance detail, but I appreciate, I appreciate the I appreciate the follow up. And if yeah. anyone's curious, um, I've dropped the link to our white paper on Halu. Um, it has a lot of details and a lot more information on this. If you're curious about it, I do want to emphasize Art's point about sort of ex, uh, investment versus expenditures. You know, this is a big investment for the the federal government to make, but it will pay off. And I think that this is true broadly of um, the advanced reactor space. You know, we're doing a lot of public-private partnerships where the government is making an investment as is the private sector. And we also would want something similar for HALU. And then ultimately this will become a private sector only activity. And we do this in this country successfully on all types of technology. A lot of the low carbon technologies that we have available to us came out of this mix of public and private investment and we reap the rewards now and it creates jobs and it creates clean energy and it helps us solve the climate problem. So we need these investments and we need to make them as a, as a society and they will pay off and they will do, do a good job for us as well as for the world as we'll be able to develop and deploy these technologies, not just here, but also abroad. Judy, you get the last word. That's all the time we have for today's discussion. There are a couple more questions in the chat. I have copied those. We'll be following up with the two people who asked them um, to do our best uh, to make sure we answer them. We've asked for an hour of your time. We don't want to take more than that. As a reminder, all the materials that we've talked about today are available on NIE's website at www.nuclearinnovationalliance.org. If you have questions or you would like to talk with one or more of our speakers, please get in touch with me at ben at renewpr.com. I'll be happy to follow up and connect you. Don't forget to follow NIA on Twitter, as Victor mentioned earlier, at the NIAORG and on LinkedIn at Nuclear Innovation Alliance. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope this event has been helpful to your understanding of this important emerging industry, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Al.